Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all very much for coming, both in person and on Zoom. My name is Steven Siciliano. I'm the president of the board of the Traverse Area Historical Society, and we welcome you to our final autumn program. And this program uh, is a special one because it is not only about presenting history, but actually doing history in this presentation today. I'd like to introduce Dr. Emily Modro. She is going to speak on Kichi Wikwadon Anasnabi <laughs> History Project. The project is, is supported by multiple grants, which she will share with you. And it is, it is uh, override, uh, underwritten uh, or supported by the Traverse Area Historical Society, which we not only present, but we also preserve and present history to our region. And Dr. Modro will do that today for you. So thank you all very much for coming. Uh, questions will be welcome, both in person and on Zoom. So thank you all. Dr. Modro. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thanks uh, on behalf of the Travers Area Historical Society for being here this afternoon, and thanks to the library for being generous hosts to the Historical Society's programming. Um, before I start, I'm going to do some more thanking. Uh, I've been working on this project, the Kichi Wikwadong Anishinaabe History Project, for a year and a half, and that work has only been possible because the project has benefited from grant funding and organizational support. Uh, many thanks go to the Trevor's Area Historical Society for its fiscal sponsorship and cheerleading. Um, I'm deeply grateful to Rotary Charities for an early vote of confidence and ongoing support through a seed grant and asset grant, <clears throat> and to the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, the Native American Heritage Fund, the Michigan Humanities Council, and Haggerty's Corporate Giving Program. The Lelano and Omina Historical Societies have been really generous with their time, contacts, and history-related resources. And the Old Mission Peninsula Historical Society hosted a much appreciated and robust discussion of this project last month. Mark Smith, Andy White, Kim Calderhouse, and Larry Wyckoff have been extremely patient, kind, and knowledgeable correspondents, willing to respond to some very strange emails from me. And Liam Berrigan was the kind of summer volunteer all research projects dream of. The most heartfelt thanks of all go, though, go to the Grand Travers Band, Tribal Council, and staff, and to the members of the Grand Travers and Little Travers Bay Band communities who have seen value in the project and have shared their knowledge and time. Chi So this project got started with a question. What does Old Indian Trail, Cadillac to Traverse City mean? I had noticed the white concrete polygonal markers in and around town, as perhaps you have as well, but did not know what they marked or why. So in early 2021, I began to try to answer that question and quickly realized how much I did not know and how much there is to know about Anishinaabe history in the Grand Traverse region, the land around the Kichi Wikwadong or the Big Bay. Setting out to know more seemed like an opportunity to make it easier for other people to know more too, through publicly visible or accessible explanations that came from the authoritative perspective, that of the Kichi Wikwadong Anishinaabe. I hoped to know how the Anishinaabe community tells its own very long story of life on this land. That remains the heart of this project. The result will take the shape of signs in Traverse City and Leelanau County. Those signs will be accompanied by a documentary film, which is currently being edited, and by a website, which is ready to go live as soon as I'm brave enough to give the thumbs up. A written project summary is also in the works. The signs, artwork film, website, and history-related contributions to date have been the work of Anishinaabek 
from Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So well-worn accounts of Traverse City's history begin with Captain Boardman and Perry Hanna, sometimes with a sidebar note acknowledging that Odawa and Ojibwe people were here when Boardman arrived in the 1840s. One part of this project is to fill out that picture using all available resources, which includes a hard look at non-Anishinaabe records and viewpoints. Up until the 1970s or so, the written record of the Kichi Wikwudong Anishinaabe was almost exclusively the work of non-Anishinaabe people, predominantly uh, white European Americans, governments, churches, armchair historians, and other observers. Now, in 2022, we know how important it is to put that version of history in its proper place and to understand its limits. To that end, I'm going to go through some of the records of the mid 1800s in the Kichi Wikwudung, focusing especially on this area, Traverse City specifically, to illustrate the state of things when it comes to doing history. Uh, as soon as I began this project, um, let's see. I have to figure out how to work this pointer, just a second. There, okay. Um, so I'm gonna back up one moment before we get to this slide. So in this area, hard copy historical documents that relate to the mid 1800s mostly take the form of maps, such as this one, and we will get there, and other land records, government treaties and reports, anecdotal observations and religious mission reports and a very few early attempts at local history, written against the backdrop of colonialism, state formation, union formation, a land grab, a lumber craze, missionary fervor, and religious competition. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and yet, in their own right, there is a lot to be gained from a careful reading of these records that have been on the shelf for over 150 years. This is a part of the project that has emerged as important, much to my own surprise, if only because it has not been attempted before. So as soon as I started this project, as I started to say, I was pointed towards this map over here on the, the screen. Um, I'm aware that people on Zoom can't see my laser pointer, so I, <laughs> bear with me as I try to narrate my laser pointer. Um, this map is from W.B. Hinsdale's Archaeological Atlas of Michigan, um, and it was published in 1931. It shows that the trail between Cadillac and Traverse City that's marked by um, these markers is just one of many known to have formed a vast network of overland routes through the region, state, and beyond. Along with trails, Hinsdale's map and its sources recall indigenous village, camp, and garden sites, as well as burial grounds, sugar bushes, and older burial mounds, all of which start to bring the pre-1840s landscape and land use into clearer view. So for those of you who haven't spent time looking at Hinsdale's maps, the red lines are trails. Um, the triangles are village sites or campsites. Um, the, the filled in round dots are um, mound, burial mounds. The, um, in black, there are some areas, you see them, they're very small uh, on this screen, but there are little squares that are hashed, I think. And those are gardens um, and other burials burial areas are marked by the circles with the X through them. And I should point out that Hinsdale was an archeologist at the University of Michigan, and he very deliberately did not put these burial areas in quite the right location. He also made the circles really big, so it sort of obscured specific locations. And that was an effort to be sensitive to the history of those people and those places. Um, 
Hinsdale's maps relied in part, sometimes in large part, on the land surveys made in this region between the 1830s and 1850s. Reading those, the circumstances of the data start to set in. Even in land surveys where records are supposed to be systematic and standardized, differences between earlier and later maps and differences between surveyors become clear quite quickly. So um, I've started this little tour through survey maps with the very end of um, Old Mission Peninsula. Uh, and you can tell from this piece of paper that it was first surveyed in 1839, and then it was resurveyed in 1857, and a lot happened in between those dates. So in the original survey, um, the surveyor just kind of put a red X through the area where the mission had just gotten started. And then in 1857, they went back in and drew a much more detailed, it's hard to see, I know, but it's a much more detailed drawing of that mission and the buildings and the land divisions within the mission. Um, so sticking with these maps for a minute, I just put these up to show roughly how how they fit together and how many maps you need to cover, you know, this much geography. So the little map we just saw would go right up here um, above um, this kind of middle upper section of Old Mission. Um, and I didn't even get to Garfield Township down here at the bottom of the bay. Um, to look at a couple of these in more detail, Elmwood Township and Acme Township go next to each other. So this connects here. Um, and again, the fact that Elmwood was resurveyed um, is, is interesting <laughs> because you can see here, you're just gonna have to trust me because I know you can't read it probably from where you are, but they, they show a trail or a road that goes to the mission, uh, which presumably was added in 1850 or 51. And I say that because Acme Township, which was not resurveyed, has no road at all marked on it. So if you put these two maps together, this little road just sort of dead ends. But if it was headed out to the mission, it must have continued. And had it been resurveyed, you, you might imagine that someone would have drawn that, that road in. What you can see on the, the Acme Township survey, though, is that, they, that this surveyor included what they call Indian fields um, at this part of the peninsula. Um, nobody included Indian anything in the, in the Elmwood Township survey. And rather than assume that there wasn't anything to include, I, I've become pretty convinced that it was a matter of um, the surveyor's interests and priorities. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, so before I tell you why, here's, here's Garfield Township, just to sort of complete the bay, as it were. Um, this was also resurveyed in 1850, uh, three years after Captain Boardman arrived. And you can see evidence of him and all the lumber activity over those three years in this resurvey. Um, you can even see Boardman's mill. It's labeled as Boardman's mill um, and a dock and a whole um, network of roads. There's a little building noted right here and a bridge that was built. Um, and that all must have been drawn on top of the earlier map. So then when we get to Leelanau County, the, the, the surveyor's habits are really different. Um, in Leelanau Township, um, I'll, I'll zoom in on this in a minute, but the notes that accompany this survey talk about the apple orchard in section 36, which is down here. They say it's very productive and they, the surveyor notes that the mission of Reverend Doherty, the guy from old mission who moved to new mission um, is established on section 36 and improvements have commenced. So then if you do zoom in to this same map, you can see that the surveyor included an Indian trail to Carp River, which is what we would call Leland, and um, includes not only uh, the village down here, but also the, the sugar camp 
up here and the fields here and the apple orchard is up here. So this, this person was clearly interested in what was there and took the time to, to put it on the map. Um, so I don't know if Hinsdale, um, the guy from the first map with the red lines, made use of Peter Doherty's maps. Peter Doherty arrived as a Presbyterian missionary uh, in Grand Traverse Bay at the end of Old Mission in 1839 and built his mission on the east side, as we saw it from that little map. Um, in one of his early letters uh, to a friend in New York, Peter Doherty starts with greetings from this end of the earth, which gives you some insight into how it felt maybe to Doherty to arrive in Northern Michigan as a, as a missionary. Um, he explains um, with these, these maps that are included in his letters that are preserved, um, that an Indian guest in his home made this map. So he didn't, he didn't draw this. And he explains that he still doesn't know the geography of where he is. Um, so he had this person draw the, draw it for him. And then he went in and, and made some notes. Um, and that that is from an undated letter, but we can assume that he made this shortly after he arrived because by the next year, by 1840, he'd met up with the surveyors who were around making the survey maps. And he says that he asked if he could please trace their map so that he could put the right lines on, on the peninsula. And that's how he came up with this map. Um, so, so Doherty, both of these maps were included in letters. Um, they weren't meant to be definitive maps of this area. They were to help his correspondent understand where he was and what he was talking about. Um, impossible to read, I know, but his little key here is really interesting. He points out, or he, he labels where his mission is and where the person he calls the old chief's village is up here. And he notes that there was a, a village here, midway down the peninsula. And he says that here where there's little number four, that's where the Catholics were. And then he points out some other villages in the area. There's one here and one up here and one here. He doesn't name them, but he, he has started to look sort of at the bigger picture by the time he made that map. Um, so I've included a few more maps and I'll just kind of run through them quickly, although they're, each one is very interesting in its own right. Um, I've included them within a date range of about 15 years following these maps that Peter Doherty made, largely to illustrate the chaos of those years. County names um, and boundaries came and went. There are various names for land and water. Um, this is an early one. This predates Doherty's map. And it was made by Henry Schoolcraft, who was appointed as the, um, the so-called Indian agent um, of this territory that became the state of Michigan. Uh, and this map is an illustration of the government treaty of 1836. So what he's showing us is the land that had been ceded by the Anishinaabek and land that had been reserved, reservations that had been created as a result of that treaty. Um, so these little yellow boxes are the reservation areas um, for a brief time. The, these, these boundaries didn't last for very long. But you can see that the surveyors hadn't come yet because they, they weren't getting this part of Michigan quite, quite right yet. <laughs> But then if you fast forward a few years, you can see that the, the surveyors were very helpful in orienting Grand Traverse Bay the way it, it should be. You can also see this first attempt at counties. Um, and so for a while, uh, what is now roughly Grand Traverse County was Omina County um, and Leelanau County was very big. Um, and a lot of these names went away as, as people made um, more lasting decisions about county names. Uh, as an aside, um, a lot of these names were in, 
invented words by Henry Schoolcraft, who did take the time to learn um, Anishinaabe Moan, uh, the language of the Anishinaabe, um, particularly the Ojibwe dialect or the Ojibwe language. And he kind of riffed on words and sounds from that language to, to make up words. And then he used those words to name counties. Um, this, I, I got sort of hung up on this because Peter Doherty's, one of Peter Doherty's early letters, it says that it was written in Omina. And, and I knew that Omina, the town didn't exist yet. And so this is the explanation that he, we were in Omina County at that point. Um, if you jump ahead to 1855, um, you can see that things have changed again. So now we we do have uh, Grand Traverse County. Um, I included this one because there's a lot of interest right now in what uh, the, the Boardman River and other water and land was called by the Anishinaabe before it got renamed. And this one caught my eye because the Boardman River, what we know as the Boardman River is labeled as the Elk River or Boardman River. Um, I also appreciate the details that this, this map maker put in um, related to this part of, of Leelanau County um, that had previously been a bit absent. And then you can see that in 1857, so even though we're moving forward in time, um, it's, it's still pretty confusing. This map just left Leelanau County off altogether. And uh, even though it was a county by that point, and, and again, it's got some different names. Here's a name for Old Mission that I had never seen before, and I, I need to do some reading about this. And, and I think this person just totally gave up and called this the Grand Travers River. Um, <laughs> didn't know what to call it, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, um, the, the, I, I do think that um, you can sort of imagine what it meant to try to keep up with these shifting names and boundaries and and then all of the administration that went with it and um, what it meant to try to come to a common understanding of who was supposed to be or who was allowed to be where and when. Um, so alongside the maps, government records tell a story in their own right of land ownership and land rights and how Anishinaabe responded to the new and quickly shifting rules. As I said, Henry Schoolcraft's map um, from 1837 shows reserved land and ceded land. Um, and as, an, as the Indian agent for this region, Schoolcraft was a prolific documenter, not only with pictures, but with words um, and with a, a really difficult legacy. So he, Henry Schoolcraft could be an afternoon unto himself. Um, so we'll leave him behind for now. <laughs> the Department of the Interior records show what happened to people and land as the land went up for sale. Um, and, and as it was purchased through land patents or direct purchases from the federal government. So this is a very small example of what you can find in the Bureau of Land Management records. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to it in just a minute. <clears throat> this is a patent document from 1849 that shows the purchase of land on the west side of the Leelanau Peninsula by an Anishinaabe man, Peter Wakazu, who elsewhere in other records is known as Pendunwan. Um, and so that was the name I put into the Bureau of Land Management records. And um, so we have the patent and then sure enough, you know, here it is in, um, in their database. But from here, you can also see that, that he owned land in Allegan County before he purchased land in Leelanau County. And this is where things start to get really interesting, I think, um, from the perspective of of trying to do history, as Stephen said. In, 
in 1849, the year that this patent is dated and the year that Peter Wakazu bought land in Leelanau County, the missionary minister, George Smith, moved with an Odawa band from Allegan County to Leelanau County. And Peter Wakazu, or Pendunwan, was the chief of that band. As a bid to avoid the kind of removal imposed on other Southern Michigan bands, Wakazu's band had bought back ceded land in Allegan County and had agreed to settle at a Protestant mission with George Smith as the missionary minister. The move north in 1849, which you can trace through the land patents and deeds, is also described in George Smith's, George Smith's diaries that hint anyway at why and where this particular group of Anishinaabe families moved when they left the increasing numbers of Dutch settlers and other changes to the people and land of Allegan County. So if, if you are interested in the George Smith records, there's a, a great book um, about, the, it's called The Old Wing Mission that um, collects Peter Smith's, or excuse me, George Smith and his wife's diaries and correspondence um, up to the point of their move to Leelanau County. So it's the history of what happened in Allegan County with that mission. It's, it's a good read. <laughs> Um, this patent and story told through Smith's diary is a great example of the best case scenario. The, his, the history weave is most tight when the story is told in multiple ways. It's also a good way to move from systematic bureaucratic record keeping to more colorful personal writing as historically insightful records of the Kichi Wikudong. I brought this map back just for the sake of having a map on hand for a moment. So Reverend Doherty started here on what we call Old Mission, and then he moved to New Mission here, which is what we call Omina. And Reverend Smith started out up at Cathead Village or Louisville, it had several names, and then moved just across the peninsula to Wakazuville, which is now the southern portion of Northport. And their letters and diaries relate some of the most detailed observations of day-to-day -day life alongside Anishinaabe neighbors here in the mid-1800s. But their purposes and perspectives are pretty complicated. Um, letters from the missionary Catholic priests at the Little Travers Mission, mostly from a priest named um, Francois Piers to the bishop in Detroit, add yet another layer. There are occasional efforts at insight into the perspectives of the Anishinaabek, but for them, that is hardly the point. Um, so I have a few examples here um, of, of these letters and, and diary entries. Uh, and I included, in the case of Peter Doherty's letters, I, I included his handwriting. <laughs> Um, they, his diaries, or excuse me, his letters are not um, transcribed into type. So to read them, you have to read his handwriting. Um, and sometimes he goes on and on and his hand clearly gets tired and it gets very tricky to read what he has to say. <laughs> I tried to include some fairly clear examples. Um, so this is from 1841. So he hadn't been here very long. Um, but in this letter, he, he this is, relates to my comment about um, kind of get, getting into the, the thinking or the perspective of the Anishinaabek. Uh, Peter says to his friend, Daniel Wells, who's in New York, the minds of the people have been disturbed by something Mr. Johnson has said to them about having to remove, an account of which I gave in my last letter. The chief, Agosa, requested me to write a letter for him to Mr. Biddle and Drew, requesting them to let him know the truth. So th there's a lot to talk about here. Mr. Johnson was the interpreter for Peter Doherty at this point. So you, you also have to imagine that these conversations between the missionary and the people who he was living with were filtered through an interpreter. Um, 
And if you watch enough movies, you know that interpreters can be fairly unreliable people, right? <laughs> right? Um, they have their own agendas. So Peter Doherty does a fair amount of complaining about his interpreter uh, and worries that the interpreter might be um, sort of provoking the, the band that's living um, at Old Mission with Peter Doherty. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the chief of this band here is asking for direct information about these rumors of removal. Um, and this, this whole period between 1836 and 1855, which were the kind of definitive uh, federal treaties for land division in this area. Um, for, for that whole period, the question of removal was a question. And you can see that play out in, in some of these letters. And um, you can imagine how it played out in the decisions that were made by the local bands um, as to kind of what to do about land and, and how to avoid removal, basically. So this comes up also a couple of years later in, in the Catholic records. Um, so these are a little less personal because they have been translated from the French and then summarized. Um, so that's why they are in the third person. Uh, Piers says to the bishop in Detroit, the, the Anishinaabek in the Grand Traverse mission are uncertain about their legal status. The land has been surveyed and will probably be sold. And he, the priest is in advising them to send a petition to Congress and to the people in Detroit to ask for the right to become American citizens and to be able to buy land in fee simple terms um, and then to you know, live under the rules of other landholders. However, because the president who was John Tyler at the time and higher officials are Presbyterians, Piers doubts that any success can come until a new president is elected. And this is where we shift into um, the, the issues that surround the communication um, by all of these missionaries. You know, they, their goal was not simply to observe what was going on around them, but they, they lived in complicated times and were in fierce competition with one another. Um, and that you, you can kind of see it from all sides or see this coming out on all sides, I should say. Mm -hmm. So in one of Peter Doherty's, again, early letters in 1841, he's talking about a person who had appeared um, at his mission and says that he was thinking seriously about taking our religion and that others were thinking of doing that too. But he, the only thing he knows of being Christian is, is imperfect because he's been acquainted with the Catholics. And he probably thinks that to be baptized is all it takes. Um, and Doherty continues to complain quite a bit about the Catholics. He's, he says that among other things which we have had to annoy us is the Catholic priest from the Little Travers who must be Pierce at this point and who came here last week or who came here the week after I returned. And he tried very hard to get some for baptism. I'd say that Pierce is even um, meaner though in his comments about the Protestants. Um, he, he tells the Bishop that the Anishinaabek are disgusted with their minister, that's Doherty. And he thinks that he could convert them all to Catholicism, but he's not gonna do this because the Presbyterian minister has the support of the government. Um, and he mentions in m several letters, this sum of $20,000 and clearly thinks that they've misspent every penny on the Protestant missionary. Um, just to belabor this a bit, he in 1844 um, mentions that he, he has a school for Catholics at Grand Travers. Um, on the other hand, and he has 160 of them. On the other hand, the Presbyterian minister, Doherty, only has 12. 
uh, even though he's been at this for seven years, which the math is not quite right. But, um, and Piers believes that in, if he could just spend the winter, winter here, he could win the pagans to the Catholic church and so break entirely the Presbyterian mission. It almost makes you feel sorry for Peter Doherty. Um, and he, again, here's where he's sort of, you know, drives this point home about the money that's been spent, misspent on these Protestants. But it is really interesting so to, to, to get away from the, the kind of mudslinging between the Catholics and the Protestants. It, th this point about what was going on in the Grand Travers, um, as far as Pierce was concerned, is pretty interesting. Um, by October of 1844, he's referring to two schools that he has created, one on the bay where all the Catholics live. We can go back to Doherty's map and, and maybe um, speculate that the, the Catholic note on Doherty's map is wh what Pierce is talking about. Um, and, and he says that there's another school as well in the upper village where the Presbyterian mission is. I'm not sure that it was directly where the Presbyterian mission is. That's as much information as we get. Um, he says that he has more than 100 Catholics and that there's a teacher who's in charge of the school every day. Um, this teacher is named again in 1851 in an annual report from Pierce. So he was here for a long time. Um, it is kind of funny to note that um, Pierce is bribing <laughs> him or somebody for reading um, the catechism. Uh, and he once again says that he's not going to try to disrupt the Presbyterian wasp, as he calls him, because the Anishinaabek are not yet emancipated. And for some reason, this ran off the page, but he says that all of the important offices for their welfare are in the hands of the worst Presbyterian of all. And I think that's the president, but I'm not sure. So it does, doesn't pull punches, this guy. Um, so I, I did include uh, that report from 1851. So seven years later, um, he must have had a, uh, this priest must have had a translator because he didn't speak English. Um, but he refers again um, to the two schools in this area. Um, the end of Grand Travers, again, is probably that village that Doherty noted. Um, this location, which is spelled in two different ways, here's one, one way, and here's the other way. Um, I don't know where that is. I have a guess, but I'm not sure. Um, but here's that teacher again. So you can start to find individuals in these stories and kind of follow their threads um, or hope that the thread pops up again somewhere. Um, but even though this area didn't have a Catholic church and mission, um, it, there was clearly quite a bit of activity on the part of the Catholic missionary priests coming from Little Travers down here. Um, the other reason I included this comment is because um, Pierce talks about the fact that uh, the teachers for the schools instruct the children when the children are present in their respective places, which is the case chiefly during winter. In the summer, they're sometimes scattered about because of fishing. Um, so that's not the only you know, seasonal note that these missionary um, teachers make. Doherty also talks about being left entirely alone in March when the Anishinaabek left leave for their sugar camps. And that comes up annually in Doherty's reports as well as the, the Catholic reports. Um, so all of that is to say that these letters and, and diary entries are, are useful in understanding very specific aspects of Anishinaabe life here, but it's also all tied up in the agendas um, and even the competitions and the desire for more funding and more money on the part of the people writing them. 
So it all has to get taken with quite a grain of salt. Um, so oh, before we get there, so I, uh, one more point about, about these missionaries. I, I think what emerges from their, their records is more of a, a history of them, of Reverend Smith and Doherty and Father Pierce and the other European American newcomers here and a history of the institutions that they represent. Um, they, they were writing for their institutions and that's pretty clear. So their small collection of reports out of Grand Traverse Bay in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s is a good illustration of how tricky they are as sources for Anishinaabe history. They're great sources for 19th century pre-Civil War missionary history and for the complicated relationships, <clears throat> excuse me, between the federal government, state formation, land rights, and religious agendas. They also show us some of the forces newly at work among the local Anishinaabe bands. But what they reveal about the Anishinaabe has mostly to do with the Anishinaabe in relation to the mission's goals and values. So what I didn't include are um, ongoing laments and worries about the impact of contact between the um, increasing number of European American settlers and the Anishinaabe bands here. And the, the reverends and the priests worry a lot about that um, from their own perspective <laughs> related to being good Christians or good Catholics. Um, so we can now kind of move on from, from our religious friends I mentioned some efforts, some early efforts at local history. And Dr. Leach is, is kind of the, the cornerstone, I would say, for that. Um, he published this history in 1883 in the newspaper, um, and it's very long. Um, and he, he, he really tried to cover a lot of ground. Um, the, the beginning is a little rough only because he pretty quickly kind of relegates the early history um, to the domain, or excuse me, it passes beyond the domain of authentic record into the dim and shadowy realm of conjecture. So he spends quite a bit of time uh, speculating about who was here kind of before 1840, and they couldn't possibly be related to the people who are there in, 18, in the 1840s according to him, which was um, popular, popular history at the time. The people who built the mounds, the thinking went, must have been a different, a different group. Um, so that, that's part of what you get through, move through when you read Leach's history. Um, but he does very helpfully, I think, talk about what was remembered in the 1880s of the 1840s here. Um, and he describes where specific things were located and where specific things happened. <clears throat> and he's nostalgic, even though he wasn't here. Um, and quite critical of, <laughs> of uh, development. So he talks about the so-called improvements of civilization, which kind of ruined the adornments of nature, as this was a most beautiful spot. And he talks about the northeastern shore um, of the Boardman Lake, which is roughly where we are right now. Um, and that was the location of a few bark wigwams where the women and children of Anishinaabe families usually passed the winter while the men were absent on their annual hunt. So the land where we are at this moment was, according to Leach, the village site in Traverse City. And he also talks, and uh, somewhat specific terms about uh, burial areas and talks about um, the area down by the water treatment plant as the place where canoes were pulled up. Um, and um, 
also talks about some of the things found in the early days of building in, in Traverse City. Um, so kind of amateur archaeology, as it were. Um, so at least unlike the other sources we've looked at, um, Leach and the people who followed him were, were, were trying to do history. So this finally gets us back to the old Indian Trail and the project that has become the answer to my original question. The markers that trace the old Indian Trail from Cadillac to Traverse City have their own history. Um, they were installed in two batches in the 1960s and in the 1980s. The ones in Traverse City were installed in the 80s as part of a sesquicentennial project. And you might recognize some of these people. Rich Brower is here somewhere, <laughs> not to name names. But um, this person in blue is Frank Edewagishik, and he's the one who was responsible for that sesquicentennial project and for putting the markers in. That, that was his project. Um, and uh, Frank and I have spoken about this project, and he's been a, a tremendous help very valuable resource. Um, beyond these trail markers, there are also some little hints that the trails and more broadly Anishinaabe history and the, the fact that the Anishinaabe had been here and, and continued to be here um, was remembered in, on into the 1920s and and maybe beyond. Um, so, it, you know, those trails were marked in the 60s and then, or excuse me, the, the Cadillac to Traverse City Trail was marked in the 60s and the 80s. What's being referred to here by the Indian Trail Bridge and the Indian Trail Lodge, that those are not near the Cadillac to Traverse City Trail. This refers to other trails, um, presumably the one that enters or that arrives at East Bay over by Mitchell Creek would be my guess. So when this postcard um, was made in around 1920, and when the Indian Trail Lodge over on 31 was around, you know, the, the names and the titles indicate that people remembered that there had been a trail there. I'm not sure if they knew where it was, but they certainly knew that it, that it was there. Um, I don't think many people now know that there was a, a trail there. So the trail that came from the south to West Bay was the one that's marked. And then we could flip all the way back to um, Hinsdale's slide to see that a major trail came in uh, from the south to East Bay by Mitchell Creek. So um, before I, I end, I, I wanted to um, kind of give another example of, of ways that you can put together um, different sources to, to get to a, a more full picture, maybe than the one you started with. Um, so uh, I found a reference uh, at some point, last spring, I guess, to a house um, that's, that's still around. Um, and I, I found that in the kind of memoirs of a man named um, Martin Melkild from Leelanau County. I believe he ended up living in Traverse City, but he was born in Leelanau County. Uh, and he writes in his memoirs about a person named Peter Ringnose um, and, and says that there wasn't, there's not a lot known about Peter Ringnose. Um, Martin was alive in the 40s, 50s, 60s, up into the, I, I think he passed away in the 90s, if I remember correctly. Um, anyway, he talks about Peter Ringnose's home, his log cabin, and, and believes that it was one of the first to have been built in the Grand Travers region. And he says that it stood near the former Fred Deckow property, which is a little south of where Louisville once was um, and where Peterson Park is. Uh, so if we remember back to the band that moved from Allegan County to Leelanau County, 
that's the same land that Martin is describing in the same village. It goes by Cathead, it goes by Louisville. It's not there anymore. And then Martin talks about what he knows of Peter Ringnose. He was the son of William Ringnose, who was the leader of a band living near Anamanese, um, which is just north of Leland. And then he, he describes how Peter was said to have looked. I don't, Martin didn't know Peter uh, or didn't remember Peter. So this is a bit of hearsay um, and is quite dated in its language. Um, so this is one of those threads that I thought, well, can we pull on this? Can we test this story at all? Um, and in, in another note, another piece that Martin wrote, he included a picture of this house that was on his family farm. I should have mentioned that, that it, it ended up being on property that his family owned. So he had a personal history with this very old structure. And here's a Melkild family photo standing in front of this structure with this history that Martin wanted to tell. Um, and then what he says is that the, at a certain point, the, his family sold the farm, but he noticed that nothing was happening with that building. So he asked if it could become a Boy Scout project. And the owners of the farm, the Fredericksons, who are still owners of that farm, said, yes, you can make it a Boy Scout project. And so um, Martin himself was involved in, in the Traverse City Boy Scouts and got them to move it. So they took apart this, this house log by log and then put it back up log by log and turned it into something called the Indian Drum Lodge Museum. And that, that's a Boy Scout term, a Boy Scout purpose. Um, I don't think it, I don't know if it was intended to have any relation to this building's history or if it was just convenient. I'm, I, I'm not sure. I don't know enough about the Boy Scouts to know. Um, so sure enough, I, I put the call out to people in this area who I thought maybe could help figure this out. You know, is there a way to, to prove this story or is this just something that this guy made up because he wanted the old log cabin to have a good story? Um, and lo and behold, you you can get pretty close if you go back to the, you know, if you if you combine the sort of personal anecdote with the government documents and and then the diaries of George Smith, you, you can actually create quite a a watertight-ish story about this house. So if you go through deeds up in Leelanau County you can trace Martin's family farm to George Smith, to the missionary who purchased that land. Um, and then when you look at, at the area that Martin talks about as being the original location of the house, the house, I should have said this too, the house was moved twice. First, before Martin was born from the Peterson Park area to the Melkild farm. And then a second time when the Boy Scouts moved it. Um, so, so that's, that's Martin's farm, the, the farm where it, it started, the Peterson area, which is now Peterson Park, is traceable to someone named John Oshawaswa, who also went by the name, um, Pamagajic, Pamagajic, and he owned the land between 1849, when the Allegan band moved north, to 1874 when through deeds you can see this land get divided and sold off by his heirs, his sons. And uh, so then if you look at the census looking for John, he's not there, but you can find someone called Ringnose um, who's, <laughs> who's cited as Ring, comma, nose. So, um, and at that point in 1870, when the census was taken, he was 98. And he lived, according to the census, next door to Peter Pamagashik, so the son of this guy. So this is where you have to make a little bit of a leap of faith. But if you decide that Peter 
was probably living next to his dad on the property that Peter would later sell. And if you decide that Ringnose is a third name that John Oshawasqua or Pamagizik went by, then, then you've, you've kind of done it. You can, <laughs> you can figure out that this guy at some point was known as Peter Ringnose, um, and that was probably his house. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a, a, a good kind of s small anecdotal story to, to end on. Um, you know, I guess another way to end a second ending would be to try to sum, sum all of this up. You know, I, I this morning was thinking, well, what is the point of, of all of this? And the point is that um, I think that it's, um, it's hard to know what you know and, and why you know it and how you know it with a project like this. It's hard to get your arms around what's there. And it's even harder to know what you don't know. Um, and the only way I think to figure that out is to ask the right questions of the right people. And what is glaringly obviously missing from, from what we've walked through today is the Anishinaabe side of the story, right? This is one way to talk about a group of people through the eyes of a different group of people. But if you want the story from the people who lived this history or whose families lived this history, then you, you have to ask. And, and for a long time, those questions haven't been asked and those stories have been ignored or suppressed or hidden um, to protect them. So the, the project has, much to my surprise, become a, a lot about trying to figure out the non-Anishinaabe side of the story um, and has become about trying to separate the, the baby from the bathwater, as it were. Um, and really scrutinize and understand what you can get out of these sources. Uh, I kind of figured that somebody would have written a book and all I had to do was find it and read it and then I would kind of get this, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, so if anyone here wants to write a book, I can provide you with a great starting point. Um, but, but I do wanna emphasize that the, the reason for this project and the real part of the project remains the Anishinaabe perspective and that story and inviting it to be told. Um, and so stay tuned for, <laughs> for the signs that will go in the ground and the other aspects of the project that should be ready to go this winter and spring. And I'm happy to answer any questions about any of, of this. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So the questions on Zoom, the first one is, are there efforts to find physical evidence of the trails? Well, um, there, there were efforts to find physical evidence of the Cadillac to Traverse City Trail. Yes, in the 70s and 80s. And I'm, I'm told that that was successful that there were um, clearly signs of um, people camping um, and building bridges across water um, along the trail and as part of the trail. But I'm not sure that that was documented in any way beyond um, just personal recollection. <laughs> yeah. Doherty's purple tree. Mm -hmm. And it was probably George Johnston of Sioux City Police. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, the school craft taught George Johnston in coming down there and, uh, and working mm -hmm. with Doherty. Yeah. So the connection between the Johnston family, Doherty, and school craft. So that's probably who it is. 
That is who it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. How many signs are there going to be? That's a great question. Um, hopefully, 16. Um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> hopefully, 16. That's the idea. Yeah. Where is the Indian Trail Bridge today? The Indian Trail from the postcard is that? So, yeah. yeah. You know, I don't. I don't know. I assume that that bridge does not exist anymore. I think it crossed Mitchell Creek or one of the other streams that came into East Bay. That's my best guess. But that is the information that was on that postcard is as much as I have at this point. There's just one more. A person said, if you wish to know more about Marty Melkid, she can provide a contact who knew him well and may know where his papers ended up. Oh, I have her email. I'll give it to you. Okay, thanks. I just like to say that I noticed that the Native American name on there was Agijek, one of one part of the Native American name that you mentioned, and it means white fisher in Anishinaabe. So that is a very definitely a Native American name. Yeah. Yes. And then back to what Jim said about um, the interpreter. It's important to understand that his father was the um, was an Irish fur trader, and his mother was. Ojibway. So um, she was a really literally the daughter of a, of, um, of a chief and of her grandmother was also chief. So um, she didn't usually speak anything but Anishinaabe in her home. But he would have had um, that language, but also English and also French. He would have known all those. Are you talking about Jane Johnson's family? Yes. Right. But if he says he does, he's the mother. But of course, that's not the name. Name or they was one. It's called a wolf, which means one that can be laid. Right. Yes. There is a a whole history of schoolcraft's relationship with the Johnson family and and the Johnson family itself. And um, I think it is now acknowledged that Jane. So Henry Schoolcraft married Jane Johnson, who was half. Uh, Anishinaabe and it was her her dad who was Irish. Her grandfather was the chief. Yeah. And Schoolcraft's papers refer pretty often to that personal connection that he had through his wife's family um, to the Anishinaabe. Um, and it was um, complicated, I think, for Schoolcraft and certainly his wife. Oh, what I started to say is that it's acknowledged that she did a fair amount of the writing um, and was a, a poet and a writer in her own right, and that he copied some of what she wrote and didn't give her enough credit. Um, her yeah. You've done a masterful job with this. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you. She was our first Native American. Much she said, nobody gets her credit for that. And he insisted that her pen name was Lee and all. Right. Which, which is, you were absolutely correct. It was a mash together of Latin and kind of a same way with Algoma. He just mashed together a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Another thing to know, though, is that Ojeda, the only reason I know that, I certainly did not put in the Nishinaabe, but um, if that's her father's name, he's the chief Ojeda, Ojeda, hmm. and that means white fisher. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. Well done. Oh, thank you. Another question is, have you met Joanne Cook of the Grand Traverse Band? Yeah. Yes. She spoke at our in-service Friday. It was fantastic. She's Thank you for opening the door to some of this history. Yeah, it's, you know, it's my pleasure. It's, I'm hardly the first and I'm definitely not an expert. Um, I feel like a real novice, actually. I, like I've just sort of... Um, 
dipped my toe into this and there's so much more to know. And um, as I said, I, I just sort of figured that someone had, you know, written it down at some point and I just hadn't found that book yet. Um, but I, I do hope that, you know, and, and people have written great histories about sp certain issues or aspects of the Grand Travers Band, like um, Matthew Fletcher's The Eagle, The Re Eagle Returns. Now I'm not remembering the exact title of his book, but it's, um, it, it looks at the history of the Grand Travers Band from a legal perspective. He's a, a professor of law and a, a um, Grand Travers Band member. Uh, and it's, it's a great book, um, but he doesn't bother with the missionaries and, and their records because that's not part of what he's trying to do with that book. Um, and there's also a wonderful book that the Grand Travers Band commissioned at the time of federal recognition um, that was written by George Weeks, the journalist, with a foreword by Jim Harrison. It's wonderful. But again, it had a really specific goal um, and was sort of walking through step by step how the tribe got to federal recognition. And so th this stuff was far from what they were interested in. And, you know, I, I hope that out of this project and out of um, other people's interests comes more available information so that people who are coming to this history um, as newbies have a place to go to find it. Because currently you have to dig around in the archives of Notre Dame and the Presbyterian Historical Society. That's not easy, not easy going. Yes. Markers, right? Yeah. Oh, um, describe what those markers are, how they decided to make those markers, what they're about, and also if you run across one, can you just give a QR code or how do you find out what, what that's about? So, currently, the question I have to repeat your question for Zoom. Um, so, the question is about markers and um, how many more there will be, and can you access a QR code so that you know more, and what is the history of the existing markers and how they look? Um, the, the existing markers that are white paint over concrete, I don't know why that shape was decided upon or by whom. I know that that happened in the 60s or even before um, in Wexford County. So the the group that started marking the trail was was based in Cadillac, and um, and so they they use this form that is just about as deep underground as it is tall above ground. So these things, you can't move them if you tried, um, and they have a brass plaque and then a painted number on each one of them, and yeah, I don't know why they chose that particular form, um, but I do know that the markers that that I'm producing uh, are not the same. So the, and and will not mark other trails. And I, I realize there's sometimes some confusion about that. So um, I did work with a, a map person, a GIS person who works for the Little Travers Bay Band to, um, make the, the um, Hinsdale map of the whole trail network, GPS and GIS navigable. So, and that will be up on the website and, and it's actually already publicly available um, <laughs> if you have the right tools. And so you can, you can trace or track those maps that way or excuse me, those trails that way. Um, but this project is not going to mark more trails because now that would be extremely difficult with private property issues and road locations and right of way and safety. So, you know, to try to mark the trail that comes in at Mitchell Creek at East Bay 
I'm not even sure where you would put a marker, um, you know, in a hotel parking lot or something like that. So, so that is why at this point, I'm not attempting to further mark trails physically. That's what the online map will be for. The signs that I'm making or facilitating, I should say, look different, but they also kind of are a nod to the existing white trail markers. And they will also have a brass plaque with bilingual text in Anishinaabe Moan and English with um, the history or the teaching that the contributors to this project decide upon. So the, what they decide is appropriate for that location, that land, that's what will go on the sign. And it's a group of elders and other Grand Traverse Band community members who are steering that and making those decisions. And the language teachers at the Grand Traverse Band will do the Anishinaabe Moan translation so that it's fully bilingual. Um, and I, um, it's important to me that I don't make any of those decisions. Uh, if this is truly an invitation for the Kichi Wikudong Anishinaabe who live here today, to weigh in on um, their own history and their own stories that they want to be publicly accessible, then you know they they get to make those decisions. So um, we'll see what they say <laughs> when they say it. Yeah. Are there more detailed maps than the one you sh showed at the beginning of your presentation about, for example, Traverse City to Cadillac? the location, actual location of the trail, or is it a matter of guesswork? Well, it's pretty specific. <clears throat> if you if you know how to do GPS and GIS, which I do not know how to, th there's a lot to work with here. Um, so, I mean, yes, the lines are thick-ish, but um, but you can do quite a bit with this. So the map that this GIS person came up with, you know, it's it's pretty specific. The the issue, of course, is you can't go and fact check your your map because the landscape has changed entirely and it's agricultural or it's industrial or it's built up or there are roads. So it's really impossible to verify or correct what's on this map. But I'd say the lines on the survey maps are slightly more refined. Um, so you could use that if you rather not use Hinsdale, but um, but this is this is this gives you enough to go on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the picture on the left, but I think it was a street. Yes. Is that like a white brochure that falls out? Yeah. Um, there, they may have it in the archives up here. There is a brochure that's the front page of it. Yes. It sort of tells you how to get to some of the places. But if I remember correctly, the problem with it is that some of those places are now by the property. Um, am I yeah. getting it right here, Emily? You are, yes. So this is from a brochure that's very hard to get your hands on. Um, I was sent the PDF version of the brochure. Uh, and yes, it does tell you how to get to some of the markers between, or no, I, mm, I think this brochure tells you how to get to some of them. There's another publication and I've only found it in one place, which is at the Ayawing uh, Museum in Peshabi Town. Um, and it tells you how to get to every single marker and it has GPS coordinates. Um, and so that was sort of the inspiration for me to work with another person who knows how to do that so that people can visit all of the 33 markers if they can get to that land. And I have not tried to get to all 33. Um, I've heard from people who ride bicycles long distances that sometimes they stumble across a marker, you know, somewhere out by Buckley. And they're always amazed that, that you know, someone put a marker in out there. Um, 
and I know that there are a couple that are very hard to get to, even in the best of circumstances, down dirt roads, deep into the woods, uh, but they are there. Um, so, and you can see at the bottom of this brochure that it was um, part of the sesquicentennial advisory agency and Frank Edewigishik who put these in and who kind of steered that project is very, um, made a point to tell me that of all the sesquicentennial projects that he remembers, this is the only one, this and the time capsule that are, that's near the courthouse are the only ones that survived, that are still around. Um, and as I said before, it would take a lot to move one of these things. These are gonna be around for a very, very long time because you can't move them. What will the name of your website be? Mm. I'll let you know. <laughs> I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs>